I am always on the hunt for ways to make my sewing room flow. I also love tools that solve problems or make the piecing less fussy. So the Madame Sew Company is always on my radar with a range of products that do just that. I was able to sit down with Anne Cassan to talk about how they develop products. And as a working mother, how does she find time to sew? So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here is my interview with Ann Cassan. Welcome, Ben, to the show. So happy to have you here. Whereabouts in the world are you coming to us from? I'm in Belgium, in Europe, uh, in Ghent, a student town in, in the north of Belgium. We know Ghent from the Treaty of Ghent. Were you originally from Ghent? A little north of Ghent, a town that was even smaller, called St. Nicolas in Dutch, but it's St. Nicholas, actually. And is that in the Flemish, English, or French side? It's in the Flemish side. So the northern part of Belgium is Flemish, and that's the same language as they speak in Holland, so Dutch, with a different accent, but it's the same language. And in the southern part, people speak French, and we have a a little part that speaks German in the east. Ah, that's interesting. Does everybody grow up trilingual? Yeah, a lot of people do because it's a small country. And there's not that many people in the world speaking Dutch either. Yeah, early on, you learn that it's important to know your languages for work, for, you know, getting around in the world. And so, yeah, French as a second language, it's in school, like in primary school already. And then from high school, there's English, but, you know, because there's so many like media and music and everything in English. Children are familiar with English from an early age. So I see we're in your craft room. Have you been a crafter all your life? No, not really. Of course you do. As a kid, you craft. And I've always been interested in it, like drawing and making little things. But then crafting like in sewing... That came when I was, yeah, when I got my first child. He's 15 now. (laughs) So 15 years ago, (laughs) I took my first sewing lesson (laughs) and I've never, I haven't stopped since. I have this idea that in Europe, making your clothes is still something that a lot of people do. Where in North America, we've gone to ready to wear. There's not as many people making clothes as there used to be. Is that true? Yeah, I don't know if there's like that many people, but there's certainly like a bit of a a trend or people are going back to it in a certain way. And then it's not like everyone is making everything themselves, you know, as a hobby. And when you have time, you, you make something special or you make gifts or clothing for your kids when they're small, because it's so cute to have these little uh, baby things that you make yourself. So there's, There is a trend of, and people also see the value in it and think it's really something worth doing, like to to make and craft something yourself with your own hands, take your time and make a beautiful thing. Of course, the majority still buys (laughs) clothing and not everything in my closet is made by me, (laughs) but I'm very proud of when I made something and I'm wearing it and... Yeah, people are also really like, oh, amazed by it. So it's not like everybody is doing it. There's a lot of young people, yeah, interested in sewing. Well, and then if we would talk about quilting, there's a big difference. Like quilting is not something that is really popular in Belgium, I feel, compared to the US or Canada. Well, quilting has had its resurgence. Well, it was a sign of patriotism for one and two it was now acceptable to go back to try those old crafts. Mm -hmm. But there's been another huge surge in quilting since COVID. So many people made masks and they had these scraps left over. So what did Mm -hmm. they do with it? Even though people might not have been making quilts, almost everybody had a quilt or knew of somebody that made a quilt at some point. So um, yeah, there's a huge huge resurgence of quilting now yeah and here it's more i think if there's a resurgence with crafting then it's more sewing and maybe knitting and and crocheting and 
less quilting. That's my feeling. But I don't have any numbers. I know I'm getting more and more people from Europe as followers and subscribers. Mm -hmm. But I think, as you've mentioned, like there's not so much of a tradition of the piecing mm -hmm. yeah. in Europe. Piecing was very much something that was in North America. So you work for a company called Madame So. How long have you been with them? Uh, five years and a half now. Yes, I started in 2018, March. So yeah, <laughs> I'm one of the oldest, uh, oldest <laughs> employees <laughs> of the company. <laughs> and your job description is content and product development? Yes, that's true. Like from the first week, that was like what I've been doing is creating content. So, and that means uh, writing the blog posts, one every two weeks was about what I do. So two a month and making YouTube videos for those blog posts. And then because we're a small company, of course, I did very, very different things over the years. Just, you know, you help out because <laughs> in the beginning we were only like four people, did different things, but then gradually it was more uh, in product development and sourcing. I'm still doing that, but in the meantime, we have like a little team of three people. So I have two uh, colleagues in the US that do the product development with me and that are even doing more than what I do now. So I'm refocusing more on the content now since a couple of months and trying new things out with the content and providing the tutorials, the information uh, about the products, uh, manuals, writing product descriptions. So it's, it's not just the blog post, so it's much wider than that, but it's, yeah, everything about sewing and sewing tools. Madame So has a really interesting niche. They, they're not actually associated with any machine in particular or type. You're all about having tools and attachments that make sewing and quilting easy. Yeah, that's a bit how yeah we started also. Like what the main focus was like, like to make sewing and quilting more agreeable and easy and accessible for a lot of people when we do the product development and we're in discussion it's always like what problem can we solve in for sewists or you know is there something quilters are struggling with or so and and how can we find a product that helps them or that makes it easier sewing a straight line or i don't know removing a thread nest from your sewing machine <laughs> and this, so there's uh, always this reflection. And another thing that we also try to do is try to give as much information as possible with the products to have clear manuals and instructions. That that has been those two things, I think, are what we try to be different than maybe other companies or what we think is important. So can you give me an example of a product that you've developed in the last year? The last year? Well, in August, we had a new, the a project bag, we called it. So it's a, it's actually a little bag. Yeah, I have it here somewhere. Well, it's not that little that you can put everything like from one project together, all the fabric creases, the patterns, maybe the tools, the threads, the buttons, if you have buttons, the little notions and keep it together and that was just something like that we noticed all three of us like you have projects that are not finished you start a new one and you want to keep that together maybe you know you can't continue because you're missing something or you want to finish something else first because you that's a, a little gift for a friend and so you have different products that you're working on and you want to keep them organized organization is also something we have a lot of things for like to organize a sewing room because it can get messy really fast <laughs> <laughs> everything is everywhere and if you have a good place for your stuff then it's easier to keep <laughs> your space clean <laughs> this is it and so right. I, i'm really proud of it because it's also like it's like this reinforced plastic and yep. and it has like two pockets it has handles and we really thought this through like what size what pockets do we need? What material? It's see-through, so you can see your project uh, that's in there. You, you can also just write 
you know, there's a little label to put here and to change for a new project. I think that's one of this year that I'm very proud of. And that is really made for Madame So. You can't find it anywhere else. One thing that I really liked that I bought from Madame So was a line of LED lights to put mm -hmm. on my sewing machine because I just found it's an older machine. It's just not that bright. And I couldn't see. I, I essentially could not see what I was working on. It didn't. Get, it doesn't get in the way. I just put it into the harp, and it plugs into a USB, as yeah. opposed to the wall. Yeah, and that's one of our like longtime bestsellers. I think we we have it in the store already for three years or four. Well, it has it has had its updates, so it it's improved over the years. But it's it's certainly one of the things that people like and come back to. <laughs> So what did you study at college or university? History. <laughs> history. <Yes. laughs> Contemporary history. <laughs> so were there any skills that you brought from that job into uh, this job? Not really, I think. So after graduating and I did different things, I tried different things out. And then for a long time, I was in uh, administration. So uh, I worked for federal government, but in education. So there's a link between the educational thing <laughs> that I did before and what I'm doing now, because I also feel like by writing tutorials, I'm trying to, you know, teach people something or or you know, it's still a bit of a learning environment. So that's something that that stayed. But yeah, the history. <laughs> what type of sewing do you like to do? Like for Madame Sew, I mainly focus on uh, small projects, things that you can uh, quickly make out of scrap fabrics um, that you don't need five days to finish. It's easier also for the tutorials, of course, to make one for a smaller project than for uh, a big, long, complicated one. And we've also noticed that projects that are more directed towards beginners and easy to make, little gifts, little accessories are easier and, well, talk more to our audience. So we've uh, tested that. Personally, like in my time off so not for work I focus on clothing yes for my kids and for me but in like now they're 12 and 15 years old and they don't really like me <laughs> sewing a lot <laughs> for them anymore so I still do like easy things like fun pajamas or maybe you know joggers pants or I can't make the jeans or <laughs> the hoodies anymore <laughs> Yeah, for myself, I like, you know, to make a dress that I maybe wouldn't buy in a store and that I try something out. And then I, I noticed that in my sewing, like what I buy in the store is more like neutral. But then when I sew, then I go a bit wild <laughs> and I try things out. And then I'm not always wearing them a lot, but I like, you know, to try stuff out and sewing that I wouldn't be buying or want don't want to spend too much money on in the store <laughs> have your children been interested in sewing not really I, my daughter at a certain point yes and then she's like oh I want my little sewing corner and then I did it I put a little sewing corner in my sewing room for her and then hmm, no she didn't <laughs> came too many times <laughs> So do you yeah. sew with others or are you just on your own? I sew with others. Every Wednesday night, I go to a, a sewing class and it's not really a class. It's like sewing together with uh, other mothers <laughs> that also sew a lot of children clothing. And it's fun because it's like I leave at 6 p.m. I leave everything behind and then I can go over there to the class and work all evening and talk, of course. And if I do that at home, I know there will always be something. The household, you know, you want to clean something up. Then you, when you're really ready, like I'm going to start sewing, then it's like 9 p.m. And then then it's like, oh, it's too late. <laughs> is that at a store or is that at a... It's at a, a school. Education for adults, but it's like, it's not strict. Like there's no like plan where you have to sew this or this but there's a teacher but we've known her like for 
15 years. <laughs> so it's, you know, she's like part of the group. <laughs> so did you start off in a class and just kept mm -hmm. going as a group? Yes. And then some, you know, sometimes people leave and there's new people coming, but there's like this study core group. group. Yeah, core group. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> we call those stitching chats. <laughs> That's a nice name. <laughs> Are sewing guilds or quilting guilds popular in Belgium? I know there's there's quilting guilds because I went uh, last week, I went to this fair how you call it like the big fairs with all the the different stores showing what they have and new stuff and there were also like stands with from uh, quilting guilds so you have a belgian quilting guild and they have like the provincial guilds as well the f smaller ones i know they exist and then i i talked to a lady over there and i think they have like 850 members or something or a thousand for the whole of Belgium but we have 11 million people in Belgium <laughs> to compare you know it's not a big country <laughs> so you're a very busy woman here you've got a full-time job you've got two children you're doing sewing on the side how do you juggle everything the advantage of of my job is that I work from home I think uh, compared to what I did before, uh, where I had to commute to Brussels from Ghent takes an hour, an hour and a half, depending on traffic. And so I'm losing a lot less time <laughs> with that because I work mainly from home. I have one colleague in Belgium. So we meet like uh, every month or every two weeks. Uh, and then he comes to Ghent or I go to Brussels, but that's just a day. And then the rest of the time I work from home so I can manage with my, you know, preparing something over my lunch break for the dinner at night or doing some laundry in the morning quickly before I start. So I think the working from home part has made it a lot more easy to manage family life and, and a, a full time job. Of course, I have a lot of help from my husband, too. I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, the kids are now also a bit older, which makes it easier as well. Yeah, I've always been doing, you know, the sewing class and the in the family and working full time. It's something that comes naturally. You just do it, right? <laughs> have you started to make a quilt? No, I haven't. I've sewn some... <laughs> little pieces together <laughs> then just to test stuff uh, or or sometimes you know like a little I made a little blog for a picture that I needed for a product and I also think that uh, I'm really fascinated by it and and I think that I, I will try it in the future but that it will be a challenge for me to be this accurate you know I've been sewing and I think you know, making little accessories and even clothing is a bit more forgiving than than quilting. So do you teach sewing at all yourself? Uh, no, not really. I don't consider myself as a teacher. You know, I do the tutorials. I, I do some research when I start a project and then I try to to incorporate, you know, most information that I can find or that I test out and, and, and that I think is important for someone who starts a project. But I don't know if that's teaching. I've never been in front of a group or uh, a class, except maybe yeah, two times in, in uh, my children's uh, school <laughs> where the teacher then asks if mommies and daddies can come and show their talent <laughs> and teach the kids something. <laughs> so I did some sewing class uh, like a, a morning with my daughter's uh, classmates. You've made a lot of tutorials. Which one has been your most popular? Um, I think if you look at the numbers, it will be the, the face mask. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. as, as you say, as you said that like quilting was uh, you know, became very popular during COVID. Yeah, the same goes for sewing. 
And people were looking for face masks. And, and so the, the tutorial about the face mask is one of the uh, more popular ones, like over time. But then, yeah, if you look at numbers or or like last month and, and which blog is still at, like from the older ones is still attracting a lot of traffic is like, I think one about how to sew with stretch fabrics. They're struggling with something that's clear. People who are who find that blog post is because they, you know, something is not working managing stretch fabric. So that's one of the ones that stays like in our top 10, 20. All those evergreen. When you devise a tutorial, are you looking at teaching a technique or are you talking about making a product? We do both. It's a bit of a mixture. Yeah, of course, there's also quilt blogs on our blog. If you have been there, you must have seen it, but the, I'm not writing the quilt blog. So we are working with some external quilt bloggers or Kathy, my colleague in product development, writes uh, some quilt blogs as well. There's a discussion, but because we want to have content tutorials for quilters and for sewers. So we try to balance a bit like projects, for sewing projects for quilting but also tips and tricks techniques um, sometimes inspiration it can be about how to wash a quilt so there's yeah different angles it there has to be a link with quilting and sewing but we're not limiting ourselves to just uh, projects what has been your favorite project to make yeah maybe uh, i last year i did um, a beach kimono <laughs> <laughs> so very simple like all rectangular pieces you don't need a pattern and I don't know I thought the result was really nice and I still like wearing it <laughs> it's this lightweight kimono and, and it wasn't a popular project at all <laughs> on the website or on YouTube you, sometimes you don't understand like why certain things work and people are you know, clicking on it a lot if you look at the numbers, because of course, as a company, you analyze the the content that you put out there. And this wasn't a really popular one, but I really liked making it, making the video. And also because I like the result and I'm wearing it a lot. I find it funny. I can never read my videos right. The ones that I am confident are going to do well, invariably don't do as well. And mm -hmm. the ones where I'm just like, oh, this video is so bad, but I've invested a week in it. So let's yeah. just put it live and it'll do very, very well. So mm -hmm. it's funny how we can't read the content, right? <laughs> no, no. And, and you, you know, I've, I've been doing this for five years and, you know, you have discussions like with marketing or with the manager about you know what kind of content and they come with ideas maybe we should do more of this or maybe we should analyze it like that and the keywords and the you know there's different ways of analyzing like what content will work you can find yeah, a lot of youtube videos about that too um and and what people are looking for and sometimes I try out something that they suggest, like try it like this, and then it doesn't work at all. Sometimes it does. And sometimes like just because something comes across, you know, like, oh, that's a neat idea. Oh, I would love to make that. Let's do that. And then all of a sudden that works. And then if you would do research, you would never come up with that idea or that project. And then there is interest in it. So, yeah. It's it's a it's a strange thing the organic traffic and the you know what people are looking for or what people are fascinated by or what catches their attention. So, what are your favorite colors? Blue and green are definitely colors that I I if I choose fabrics that I choose a lot. So I was uh, looking for scraps for a new project and and I was like uh, sorting them a bit and then. The pile of blues and greens was definitely bigger than the others. <laughs> now, are you a just a machine quilter or do you do hand sewing too? Like, do you like embroidery or um, sitting with a fabric and needle? When I started sewing, I was really like, I if I could avoid 
taking a hand needle I did but that changed so over the years I've you know like finishing up a project with some hand stitching is like something I I'm not afraid of anymore but I was at the beginning it was like if I can do it with a sewing machine uh, uh, no patience just a <laughs> quick fix <laughs> I would do it um, but the hand sewing yeah limited to rep repairing stuff or or finishing off or adding a little something to a sewing project. Madame Sew so has a wonderful palette or bucket or container filled with lots of different presser feet for your machine. Mm -hmm. Do you get to play with those all the time? Yes. <laughs> and especially in the beginning, because it was something that was one of the products that the company started with and made the company in a certain way because the presser foot set was like our first big product. That was something I had to learn from the first weeks to, to use all those feet and to know what they were for and and how to for what kind of stuff you could use them and show that to the customer. So I've done a lot of little videos with the the presser feed it has been a little less the because yeah we have all that content of course that we can still use the last years there's still some new presser feed that we've added to the store but yeah the main thing stays like the big 32 uh, feet presser foot set and for myself like when i'm uh sewing um you know clothing or things not for uh work there's I think there's like four feet that I use a lot and then the other ones yeah depends of course on what kind of projects if you're not gathering then I'm not using a gathering foot of course but yeah I like to use the like the overcast foot a lot or the the little rolled hem foot the stitch in the ditch, even though it's like more a quilt foot. <laughs> I think, you know, like for edge stitching and stuff, I, I like to use that one. And also the quarter inch quilting foot I also use. You sent me some stuff. Here, I've got the bag. <laughs> yeah, that's also one of the, like for this year, one of the more popular products that we launched. But it was at the beginning of the year uh, in January. I like the fact that there's a handle on it, the ruler. So this is for hemming, hemming. Yeah, on your on your iron on your ironing board. Oh, a quilt storage bag, and this I love. Chalk. I like that it's chalk, so it's not permanent. And I think the yellow is so much more effective than um, white. Do you have any other ways that you use this other than for a hem? Also use it for mitered corners. So to, to iron them, I have a little video showing that. <laughs> That's the main two things where I use it for. So it's for uh, hemming and, and mitered corners, yeah. It's an interesting thing because it's um, a little bit thicker than normal. How weird, like, isn't it strange that um, quilting is all in inches? Yeah. Yeah, and I noticed that the trade show <laughs> last week, like where there was quilting stuff, I was like, now I'm in Europe, in Belgium, and I'm at the quilt <laughs> fair, and and still, you know, all the rulers, everything was in inches. Um, no centimeters there. <laughs> and there's no nice um, conversion either. No. Like a quarter of an inch is not... no. Something nice and easy, like five millimeters or something like that. No, no, no. the, it's all the formula is like, yeah, you, you really have to just put it in your computer because the formula, even if you want to do it, it's not right, easy. It's, no, <laughs> not nice. it's so difficult. It's, it's funny because um, my country began to go metric when I was a, a, a student and they went gradually. So it went, we did temperature first. Then we did um, linear, and the last to come was weight. And, well, I'm bilingual, I say. I can yeah. do both. Yeah. But metric is so much easier. <laughs> so much easier. <laughs> I think so, too. But I always think, like, yeah, that's because I grew up like that. 
if people are wanting to watch one of your tutorials, how do they find you? So if they want to see the videos, then they can go to YouTube. I think type in Madam So and you will get to our channel. So we have uh, over 200 or 150 to 200 videos on the channel. So I think they will find us like that. And most videos are linked to a blog and the blog is on madamso.com. So um, they can also go there and from the blog, go to the video, but you can go to my tutorials two ways <laughs> through YouTube or to the blog. And if people want to get a hold of you directly, how do they get a hold of you? Um, they can write me an email. I'm, it's really easy. Well, my name is just Anne, so A N on <laughs> at madamso.com. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. It's been fun talking to you. It's been really fun. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Anne Cassin. I'm hoping I can meet up with her on my Holland Textile Tour next September. If you would like to take a look at the Madame So online catalog, I'll leave a link in the video notes below. If you would like to contact Anne directly, I'll leave her email and social media links there too. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing in the background. I have interviewed so many interesting people on this show. Let one inspire you. And check out my last video on fabric organization. Take care and I'll see you next time.